Hi, I'm Colin Eberhardt, your host for tonight, and it's up to me to welcome you to another open source fintech meetup. This is a, an event and a, and a, a group organised in collaboration between Scott Logic and Finos. We started this uh, partnership and this meetup group in Edinburgh uh, last year and now have events in both Edinburgh and London. And this is our very first of our Bristol uh, meetups. So a, a special welcome to any attendees in the Bristol area. We plan to resume face to face meetups in all three locations when once it's safe to do so in 2021. And we're all very much looking forward to doing that. Today, uh, we're joined by Toby. Uh, Toby is an open source strategist and founder of Unlock Open, a, a, a consultancy that helps large organizations build strong open source cultures. And when I first uh, met Toby, I, I had a look at some of his previous presentations on his website. Um, Claire, who organized this meetup, said, take a look. Which of these presentations should we ask Toby to do? And I, I looked at them and thought, wow. Um, I like I like them all. Can we do a special like five hour session? So I, I eventually had to, had to pick. And then this one really was quite interesting. It, within this meetup, we haven't we've talked about um, open source, uh, focusing on the code, focusing on projects, focusing on on the community around open source. But we've never really talked about uh, how open source can help the um, employer brand and how it can help um, attract talent. So. With that in mind, um, one well, one final thing: we'll have we'll have Q and A. So if you've got any questions, do pop them in as as we as we um, as we continue. But that's that's it from me. That's the introduction over and over over to Toby. Thank you so much, Colin. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm really thrilled uh, to be here, um, and only to be here for half an hour and not five hours, as uh, Colin suggested. <laughs> I should do. Um, so let's get started. Today, yeah, I want to talk to you about recruiting, retaining, and fostering top talent and how open source and, and sort of like building your, your visibility and brand around that uh, can, can really help. Um, and uh, for that, yeah, I want to start by giving you a little bit of context. I'm sure you're really familiar with the idea of the technology adoption lifecycle, um, which is, you know, this idea that you have a really small percentage of the of a given population that as are innovators or given population of companies, right? Um, sort of like a larger that are early adopters, then you have the early majority, uh, the late majority and the laggards. Um, so what's really interesting is when you look at how many people, how many companies actually consume open source, you really see that this is something that has um, really reached um, you know, the, the, the broad, uh, pretty much everyone today, every company that's building anything uses software and all of them essentially use open source. So there's this really interesting uh, report that comes out every year uh, before it was from Black Duck, but now that Black Duck has been bought by Synopsys, it's from Synopsys. And it's called the Open Source Security and Risk, uh, and Risk Analysis Report. And so what they essentially do is um, when they have mergers and acquisitions, they do audits of the code base. And as a result, they um, sort of measure uh, how many code bases uh, contain open source and what percentage of the whole code base that actually accounts for. And so in 2019, uh, of the 1,200 um, audits that they ran, uh, they found open source code in 96% of them. And that accounted for over half of the code base. What's interesting is, um, in in uh, fintech, it's actually in financial services. It's actually literally a hundred percent of all of the code bases that they um, audited uh, contained open source. So um, that's in stark contrast to how much companies actually contribute back to open source. So this is a survey um, uh, called the Open Source Programs in the Enterprise Survey. Um, which I think um, is um, a uh, Linux Foundation, the new stack survey. I'm not 100% sure anymore. You, the, the link is there though. Um, I'll, I'll be sharing the slides afterwards and you can certainly go have a look at the survey itself. The data is really interesting. Um, and so in that survey, it shows that um, when it comes back to contributing to open source, um, only 10% of financial services contribute um, often to open source and another 19% sometimes. So we're really sort of like in the, 
early adopters, innovators, early adopters um, side of things. Not so much, this is not so much mainstream in this industry yet. Um, and what's interesting is when you compare it to the tech industry, uh, well, obviously in the tech industry, um, contributing back is actually really has become mainstream and, and most companies do it uh, regularly. So, well, you know, why is this important? This is sort of what we're going to discuss, but what's important to remember here is that really, if you want to be ahead of the pack, if you want to uh, be leading in uh, your industry, uh, just consuming open source um, and uh, it really isn't enough anymore. You really have to be part of, of building it. Um, and then not only that, but once you actually have done this, uh, and are, you know, have built this strong open source culture, uh, you also have to actually do something and leverage it, um, not just like let it sit in a corner. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, first of all, we're gonna talk about why should you care about building a strong open source culture? Secondly, about why do developers actually care? Um, thirdly, how you can improve your open source culture. Why should you make it more visible? How can you make it more visible? And then how can you leverage that visibility to actually um, benefit your, your recruiting and hiring process? Because that's really the topic of this talk. So why should you care about building a strong open source uh, community? Uh, sorry, an open source culture. Um, and the reason for that is actually fairly simple. It's because the developers that you want to hire care about this. And so here's a study that I ran. It's a, so it's a Twitter poll, right? It's, you know, it's a study. But it's a study that I ran actually four years ago um, where I asked how important it is to you to be able to release and contribute to open source software as part of your full-time job. So 65% of respondents um, actually said that, that that was super, uh, you know, extremely important or somewhat important to them. And only 18% thought that this was not at all that important. And you're going to say, well, of course, Toby, because the people that follow you, um, uh, you know, care about open source. And so this is a, you know, really biased sample. I agree. But what's interesting here is uh, this actually had over 2000 votes. So I have about 4,000 um, followers on on uh, Twitter, uh, when I do a poll, usually I get like an, 100 answers, right? Like getting that level of engagement is actually uh, rather uncommon. So this was even in 2016, a topic that developers really cared about. Um, and Corey House ran uh, a similar study uh, two years later in 2018 and got like really uh, similar numbers and also sort of like similar traction for his um, poll. So, um, you know, essentially, the reason that you should care is because developers actually care about this. And you might wonder, well, why would developers actually care about this? Think about it. Um, when you're actually trying to hire a new developer, um, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to go check their GitHub profile, right? And so, you know, there's, there's a ton of problems with this sort of thing where we assess people by sort of like their open source contribution and the contributions that they do oftentimes um, outside of their day job, right? Um, and I'm, I'm more than happy to actually talk about this um, in the Q&A if this is uh, interesting uh, to you because it's, it's a topic that bundles privilege and uh, uh, the pay gap and, and, and a lot of, of, of diversity and inclusion aspects that we don't really often talk about in this context. So I think it's actually quite interesting. But regardless, the truth is um, we, um, you know, as hiring managers, as uh, companies, we really consider uh, the GitHub profile of someone to be essentially their resume, right? The second reason why developers cares care, it's actually because it's a window into a company's internal culture. Like if you really want to see how a company works, seeing how they're treating open source, um, how they're um, contributing to open source, how their employees are um, um, behave, uh, work, the kind of quality of the code that's, that's coming out of a company, all of this is made really easy by open source. Then thirdly, um, open source actually provides intrinsic motivation 
in jobs where would be otherwise not necessarily there. What I mean by this is not everyone can work in a hot, exciting new startup, right? There are lots of, of areas of where developers are needed that um, maybe don't come with consumer facing open source, for example, oh, well, sorry, with consumer facing code. And so just being able to participate and um, be part of like this broader community and showcase to what you're doing um, when that's not necessarily possible, if you say working on internal tools, for example, is something that's going to be very attractive um, to people in general. Fourthly, it allows you to bring your whole self to work. For a lot of people, myself included, um, open source and the network of, of people that you've built around open source is, is something that's critical um, and something that's really part of them. And so being able to continue being both part of the company in which they're working, but also part of this broader ecosystem of people working on code is something that um, is really important to a lot of people. And then lastly, companies that are open to open source, that contribute to open source, um, it makes it really easy for you to bring your own tools. And then when you leave that company to go elsewhere, uh, continue being able to use the same tooling that you've built um, and open sourced. Um, so, you know, obviously you can't just um, talk about having a good open source culture. You actually have to improve it, right? And that is of course like the hardest part of this whole, this, this whole thing. Uh, but here are like a few tips that you can do um, to start thinking about this at least from the, the right perspective. Um, so we're gonna look at, um, um, focusing on people over communities, over projects, over company first. Um, I think this is a really important notion is we often think of open source as code, uh, essentially. Uh, in truth, what's really important in open source is not only the communities, but also the individuals in those communities and making sure that they're all comfortable, well-respected, um, and well, well taken care of. Um, and, um, you know, that also applies to how you treat them inside of your own company. And I want to read this really nice um, uh, quote from Tom Preston Werner, who's the co-founder of GitHub, that he wrote like over a decade ago. And he, he writes this. I'm going to read it because I think it's really important. Let's face it, great developers can take their pick of jobs right now. And this was true a decade ago, it's still true today, despite um, you know, the, the ongoing uh, health crisis, health, health crisis um, and you know, other issues, right? These same developers know the value of coding in the open and will want to build up a portfolio of projects they can show off to their friends and potential future employers. So this is what I was talking about earlier. That's right, a paradox. In order to keep a killer developer happy, you have to help them become more attractive to other employers. But that's okay because that's exactly the kind of developer you want to have working for you. So relax and let them work on open source or they'll go somewhere else where they can. Um, so, you know, what's important for me here is to really think about the people that you hire as individuals that have aspirations of their own, desires of their own, and to, to treat them that way. Um, and to me, it's something that's interesting because it's something that's actually really telling in really small details. And I'm gonna give you a few um, uh, right here. Um, we see this fairly often, um, people that join a large corporation and that are given like a really silly um, email handle, like, you know, the first three letters of your first name and the th uh, first three letters of your last name. And then sort of like the year you started working at that company. Um, another thing that we also, that I also kind of see uh, often is huge legal disclaimers at the bottom of, of emails. Like you're sending like a one-liner to say something and then there's like, you know, a page and a half of, of, of legalese behind. I, of course, I understand all of the reasons that these things exist that way, right? It's, that's the corporate policy and you know, the lawyers insist on it, et cetera, right? 
Um, uh, uh, another typical example is um, requiring that your employees use a different GitHub handle for their work um, than they do for what is not work. And all of these contribute to sort of like dehumanize uh, the people that are working for you and um, makes it also difficult for them to build credibility and even a portfolio um, in, um, in the open. And so these look like tiny things, but they're actually oftentimes red flags. And if you ask developers, like they probably will tell you that these, yeah, it's okay, I can deal with it. But there are things that really touch people in, in their identity and the way they present themselves and that actually have a lot of impact, even if they sound like small and, and, and not really important. Um, the second thing that you can do to improve your open source culture is to make your policies um, around open source actually less of a hurdle. So, uh, well, this is another talk that Colin uh, probably suggested I should have given. I've actually given a whole talk um, on this topic, which is called Open Source Contribution Policies That Don't Suck. Um, and you can listen to a recording of this that I did for um, FinTech earlier this year. And we also have half the slides, which are pretty uh, explicit. Essentially, it's, it's a talk where you discuss what you can do to make it more seamless for open source um, to happen in your company while protecting the, your IP and making sure that your legal team is comfortable with it. And it actually you know, goes into offering a number of solutions that are win-win from both an engineering perspective and also from a legal perspective by focusing everyone on the business outcomes that you want for your company. Um, another common thing that I see sort of a, as an anti-pattern is companies deciding, oh, open source is important. We should totally do open source. And then they sort of like create an open source group somewhere that does open source while the rest of the company continues to work as usual. Um, it's the same kind of anti-pattern that you see was um, innovation. We have um, a company that suddenly decides to have an innovation lab. Um, this kind of tends to create um, a rift between the people doing open source and the rest of the engineering team. And you don't really get the benefits that you would uh, otherwise do. So it's really something that I um, strongly recommend against. You're much better off trying to do like small steps for everybody than just like picking a bunch of um, elite open source developers and making their lives super easy and not doing anything else about the lives of all of the rest of your developers. Um, I've mentioned that already, but aligning your open source effort with business goals is critical. And it's critical um, because if you don't do that, what ends up happening is whenever you end up, you're in a situation like this one, uh, where uh, you know budgets are shrinking, everyone's sort of like afraid of what the next year is going to look like, and, and the bottom line, and you know, and, and, and all of these um, issues because of COVID. Um, well, the first thing that tend to go and that tend to like no longer um, be, um, you know, be part of, like, have attention on are things which aren't tied to business goals. So I think it's really, really important that um, you tie, you strategize your open source effort and align it with the business goals that you might have. Um, just checking the time here, all well, good. Uh, then, of course, what you want to do is actually measure the effort. Right, because if you know if you're not measuring the impact of what you're doing, and it, it's really hard to continue supporting it in the long term. Um, and lastly, what you also really have to do is reward it, because the worst scenario that you can have is when you suggest as as a as a company that open source matters to you, but then um, you know no one actually ever gets a bonus because of the open source effort that they've pulled. Like someone has contributed to a project that's really key to the company. Uh, but, you know, as a result, they were less involved in an, an internal project. And so they don't get a bonus or they don't uh, get rewarded for it. They don't become like a senior engineer or something like this. So all of these sort of like aligning with business goals, measuring the, the outcomes that you actually decided were important for your strategy, and then rewarding the people creating those outcomes are really part of like anchoring an open source um, strategy um, in a company and making it um, worthwhile from a business perspective and, and long lasting. All right, so now that you sort of have the keys of um, understanding um, why open source is, is important, um, 
uh, how you can sort of like make it more prevalent at your company, um, then starts the question of like, why should you actually make it more visible? Um, and for that, well, I'm just gonna uh, use um, uh, sort of like a, a full quadrant graph to um, place companies on whether they have actually a strong or weak open source culture, and then whether that culture is hidden or visible and how that actually impacts uh, retaining, uh, recruiting and fostering talent. So um, here you'll see in the, uh, you know, in the first quadrant, uh, so strong and visible, you'll see um, com like large tech companies like Microsoft and Facebook who used to be um, sort of like, you know, had a week uh, and, and sort of like, um, you know, um, probably hit an open source um, uh, practice uh, who moved to become like really strong and visible. And also you'll find um, GitHub, of course, you know, it's a canonical example of like, you know, a trailblazing company in that space. Um, a really interesting company for me is uh, here is Amazon in particular AWS who actually has uh, IBM actually falls in the same category companies who have like a strong open source uh, present but uh, it's not super visible they're not releasing a lot of uh, software they're essentially contributing to the software of others um, and so um, you know, that still has a lot of benefit but it's missing out on the, the recruiting angle. And of course, sort of like um, in your um, bottom left quadrant, you have companies like Oracle who have like a weak open source culture and also that obviously is not uh, very visible. Um, so from a perspective of recruiting, right? What matters is visibility. If you have a visible culture um, and you're going, to, it's gonna be easier for you to recruit a talent, even if that culture internally is actually quite weak and sort of like, you know, a fluff around the surface. Um, however, uh, of course, that's going to hurt from a retaining perspective uh, because people will figure it out pretty soon once they're internal, you know, inside of the company. Um, and, um, and as a result, will tend to leave. On the other hand, you know, uh, Amazon that was in the strong, but sort of like not really visible quadrant um, is actually gonna be really good in retaining. And, and it's um, interesting to see that AWS actually, a lot of people in the work there have been working there for quite a while and stay there uh, a long time. Um, and um, of course, fostering talent also comes with essentially a strong open source culture. It doesn't have to be visible. So here again, even a company that you know isn't really visible about it, like AWS, um, is going to be successful in using open source to improve um, uh, the the ability of uh, its engineers. Um, so the question is, um, you know, now that you know that's actually important to make it visible for recruiting, is how can you do that? Turns out that you can do quite a bit. Uh, relatively cheaply, and it's kind of baffling when you just put yourself in the shoe of um, a candidate to a company, how badly a lot of companies are doing um, a job there. Um, go visit just like github.com slash your company, uh, which is exactly what a candidate will do, just like you go visit github.com slash their, hand, their GitHub handle, right? And you'll see a number of uh, GitHub orgs that um, really... Uh, are not showing a lot of activity, have very few, uh, you know, like large companies that have like, I don't know, like 10, uh, 15 people. And then go check out like the website of a company that does, you know, the, the GitHub org of a company that does that well, like Microsoft. I think they have like 15,000 people in their <laughs> github.com uh, uh, slash Microsoft, right? Another thing that you can do, which is have, you know, have a dedicated website. A lot of companies actually do that by having, um, a github.io pages website uh, that mirrors to open source, uh, the open source subdomain of their company, but something of, of that nature, right? Uh, something where you showcase not only the project that you've released, but also uh, you showcase um, people, uh, the actual engineers working on this. It could even be was like interviews. It's just really nice from the perspective of like someone that wants to be recruited to see Oh, there were other people, right? Uh, who are these people? What are they working on? What are they getting excited by? And it's also really important there to have like uh, a diverse um, uh, engineering a group of, of, of people being represented that mirrors, you know, what you what your company 
is on what your company wants to achieve in terms of diversity. Another really interesting thing that's fairly um, cheap to do and super effective is to have an engineering blog where you actually talk about either the projects that you've, you're involved with or the, um, you know, the challenges that you've met internally and that you've, um, you, you know, how you solve them, et cetera. Then you can have things that are more proactive and more, that are actually a bit more costly. Uh, you can fund some of your dependencies. Um, some projects have done that just by using things like um, um, Open Collective. Uh, I think it's called Build. No, it's not called Build Your Stack. Um, Open Collective has a, a solution that lets um, uh, with some tooling that essentially lists all of your dependencies and then sort of. Uh, you pay them a lump sum and they divert that money where, you know, best works with them, the dependencies that you're relying on for your project. Um, some other companies, I'm thinking of Trivago, for example, have invested uh, on particular projects that they were relying on and where they wanted to see improvements and have seen um, a lot of benefits out of those uh, investments, not only in terms of having those projects actually improve and be better serve them from a technical perspective, but also of, of being really perceived in the industry and in particular like um, com open source communities as um, um, you know, positively in invested in open source and having lots of people actually just um, uh, voluntarily come in and see if they could work for that company. So uh, you know, then this is something that's a bit more involved but actually uh, has some nice impact. And obviously like getting your staff and your engineers to speak at conferences and even sponsoring conferences is also uh, really impactful. Um, lastly, once you've done all of this, um, you actually want to leverage um, this effort of having improved your open source culture and made it more visible uh, so that it not only serves your engineering teams and the people on your teams to give them more of a public persona if that's what they want, but also serves you and serves your recruiting purposes. Um, here, I sort of like see sort of like two strategies that you can um, either do both in parallel or separately. Um, one is really about branding. If you think about a company like GitHub, um, they don't really have to um, have, you know, the brand from an open source perspective is so strong that they don't really have to say, hey, look at what we're doing here. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, come, come work. Here's an open source project that we've just released. If you're interested by it, come work for us, right? It's more about sort of like a long-term effort that they're doing where uh, they're essentially driving their brand so that they're always um, uh, interesting and exciting to developers, right? Um, the other sort of like more response marketing kind of strategy is to tie um, specific job offerings that you might have open to specific open source projects that you might be invested in, right? So imagine that you have, um, you know, an open source dot, uh, your company, uh, dot com, um that presents some of like the projects you're working on Having a list in there that's tied to what kind of projects of, hey, and we have actually like, we're looking for two Ruby developers um, is something that can, you know, have a very direct effect on getting people from just checking your website to actually applying, right? Um, and, and yeah, and you can, you know, this is sort of like organically is sort of like the brand marketing response and, and structured is more like actually funneling visitors into open position and also, uh, the other thing that you really want to do is to um, have your recruiters be aware that you're, you know, you have a strong open source culture, um, and that is something that is um, important to you. And um, make sure that the candidates are aware of that and see that as a perk, right? And I think that was this. I'm um, essentially uh, um, done with the presentation part, and I'm looking forward to your questions. And we're spot Thanks on on time. This is great. Brilliant. Oh, perfect timing. Thanks a lot, Toby. Yeah. If anyone's got any questions, do add them to the to the chat. I mean, um, firstly, thank you. So there was some fantastic in, advice in that talk. Uh, something that resonated with me was um, how you can make some of the work you're currently doing more visible. Um, it's 
it's quite often that, that you forget about capitalizing on what you've done already. Yes, we, uh, I, I know reflecting on Scott Logic, we could certainly improve, but we don't we don't really do enough with what we've done already. And we're we're working on our own open source microsites at the moment. Oh, I also I'm, I also I'm really like, to hear that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it it's uh, it was an eye opener. Also, I really liked your point about um, how you improved the culture. And the one that really jumped out at me was aligning it with business goals. I've seen a lot of efforts to improve open source culture that were not aligned with business goals. And that never, it never sticks. If it's not aligned, it will always fall by the wayside. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, this is something that I, I, I think we, we don't talk about enough in general. And we, all, we often sort of, um, you know, when people are concerned about their open source in their company, like engineers are concerned about like not being able to do open source, it really often becomes sort of like a a, a fight is not the good word, but like a, a tension between um, engineering and legal. It's like, oh, it's the lawyers, like they won't let you, they won't let us do anything. Um, and that's because it's, you know, never driven by like real business goals, right? Exactly, yeah. And, and the second it is, goals, it changes. Business yeah. goals clear the path. They do, right? Because you know, suddenly it's the, you know, suddenly every, everyone like all sides are aligned was, oh, okay, well, damn it. We really care about recruiting. This is important for us from a recruiting perspective. We should absolutely do this. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a comment in the chat, a very interesting one actually from uh, Jerry. He said, he heard a talk from an IBM open source lead. And one of the learnings he had was that companies need to let developers be individuals and participate as themselves even whilst they have the company name associated with them. And if that doesn't work, if legal has to get involved with all talks, blog posts and so on, it, it, it kind of, it, it stifles things. He asks, have you, have you seen this too? Yeah, so um, um, thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, and I think this is sort of what I was trying to address in um, really putting people first, putting people first in your company, right? Making sure that they can be themselves out there and, hire, and, and building a trust relationship with them, right? Um, it, of course, like if, you know, if every time you have to have any kind of public interaction, you have to go through PR and legal, um, it slows the, everything to a crawl. How can you be part of an external community? How can you even drive the interest of your own company outside when you need to, if you need to get everything sort of like, you know, when there's so much red tape, right? And this is a problem that I often see, and I often see this obviously in regulated industries, right? Yeah, absolutely. It, we it, With our blog, we, we have an engineering blog and um, I encourage people to write as, as themselves to express their own personality through the blog. I Quite often, um, I, I review a lot of the blog posts that come through and I, I don't think I've ever had to censor any of them. Typically my feedback is along the lines of, what do you think? What do you feel? You know, t tell right. us what you really think about the technology. And um, as a result, there are quite a few people who can now just publish immediately to the blog. We don't feel the need to, to have a, a, a sort of censorship or legal sort of plastered all over it. And, and it's, it very much reflects his point around about letting individuals um, express themselves. Yeah, and, and you know, put yourself from the you know from the perspective of someone that's actually considering a job there, of thinking, oh, I'm going to go work for this company. It means all of my interactions with the outside, I'm going to be babysitted through them essentially. Like my hand is going to be held until I, you know, I'm. It, it's it's sure that I'm I'm um, trustworthy and everything is double checked. You know, it's it's um, not the most compelling thing, right? No, and you've got to trust your employees. That they're, they're grown ups. They understand that uh, companies are built on IP. They have product roadmaps. They have sensitive information, and, and you've got to trust them to to not divulge that. And ninety nine point nine percent of the time, the engineers know what they're doing, and, and you should trust them. Right, and, and there are ways to to address this, right? Um, of course, I mean, one of it is to have education around these topics. Um, make sure that people understand actually, you know, what mat why IP matters, uh, what IP matters, et cetera. Um, and another thing that's interesting also to be aware of is, you know, this is a classical uh, joke about the, the CTO, the CIO is the last one to hear about like uh, what technology is used internally, 
right? It's like people actually do this, right? I mean, I've, I'm not going to name names, obviously, but I'm, I've, you know, bumped into engineers um, working in large banks that were telling me, um, oh, yeah, we can't contribute to this project because we're not allowed to. So we contribute at night with using our, our own accounts so that we can actually do the work that we need to do for the company. Right. So it's yeah. not even it's not even about them. It's about getting their job done for, you know, for the their employer. And they sort of have to do this like in the background in secret. And I mean, from like an IP perspective, like you're facing the same problems that you would otherwise accept. You're not even aware that this is happening. Right. So actually cleaning up your policies, opening them up. Um, is actually going to give legal a much, much better visibility into what's going on, right? And it's also going to allow legal to focus on the stuff that matters. Because that's the other problem is if you have like 20, 30% of your workforce that's actually contributing to stuff, some of it will be really close to like core IP that you want to keep proprietary. And some of it will just be random useless. Uh, I mean, useless from an IP perspective, right? Like it has yeah. no value to like uh, as an asset. Um, and if none of this is visible and clear, you, you know, you can miss out the really big ones in a sea of like menial problems. Cool. Uh, let's, let's wrap up with one, one final question. Uh, something's come up in the chat. No, but one final question I had for you. So. Um, uh, taking it sort of one step further, I noticed in your survey that 65% of its, uh, uh, respondents were extremely or somewhat, found it extremely or somewhat important that their job allows them to contribute. And I think the other survey, the total was more like 70 of the same kind of sentiment. Now, interestingly, in my experience, 60 or 70% of software engineers do not contribute to open source. And I wonder whether there's there's a kind of gap in the market for, for um, employer brands to, to actually helping their engineers get better at open source contribution. It looks like there's an, people want to contribute, but in practice, I don't think that many people left to their own devices would. So that's an, a great point. And I think you're absolutely right. Yes, uh, I believe, strongly believe that, um, and you know, and there's proof of that in smaller organizations, right? There, um, smaller organizations that actually train and invest in their employees to put them and support them once they start doing open source, um, do really attract a number of people that are really excited by that perspective and that are generally really talented um, engineers. But I think what's also really important about this, and I sort of like hinted at, at this in, uh, in the presentation, um, we have a huge diversity gap um, in, in tech. And if you actually look at the data, the diversity gap in, in, in uh, open source is terrible, right? So if you look at tech, you're talking, depending on, on, the, on, uh, you know, on the surveys and how you count things, um, we're like roughly 80% of the developer population is male, roughly speaking. Um, in open source, you're more around like 95, right? Wow, that's pretty um, bad. It, it's, it's terrible, right? And, and what's really terrible and, and quite unfair is that open source is actually a carrier accelerator for a number of people. Like being involved in open source projects um, will build a network uh, of folks around you that you can rely on for new job opportunities, that you can rely on for help, and it will just make you a better developer, build your soft skills, et cetera. So um, the fact that... Um, open source has such impact on people, on people's career, and that it's really reserved to essentially um, men, um, you know, contributes to really um, increase um, the, the gap that we have and the diversity issue that we have as an industry, right? And so a company that would actually invest in um, open source and in, um, you know, training their engineers, and making sure that the folks that they train come from a diverse background and include women and include uh, you know, people of color and include non-binary people, et cetera, uh, can really uh, you know, sort of help uh, create a, a really good career path and like level these, these people up. And I think that's a huge opportunity, frankly. Like if you actually care about like fixing the diversity gap in your company, thinking about building a strong open source program, is probably going to be uh, very effective and will you know, position you in a really good position to do that. So, yeah. Yeah. 
yeah that's, that's fascinating food for thought i think we'll we'll wrap it up there so thanks once again toby and thanks to everyone My who pleasure. attended yeah really looking forward to the next one and looking forward to at some point in 2021 getting getting back together in person and uh, and meeting yeah, up absolutely. once again so thanks a lot toby and uh cheers everyone you're most welcome Goodbye. thank you everyone